great book, though. Um, thank, thank you so much for coming to Marlborough College. Rachel has written for The New Yorker, The Guardian, The London Review of Books, The Los Angeles Times, The Nation, Slate, The Three Penny Review, McSweeney's, and other publications. And her essays have been anthologized in the Pushcart Anthology and in Best American Essays. Her book, A Chance Meeting, uh, by Random House, um, was, pub was published by Random House in 2004 in the US and the UK and in Delphi in Italy. It won the Penn Gerard Fund Award and was a finalist for the Guardian First Book Prize and the Penn Martha Albrand First Nonfiction Award. Uh, Rachel has been a fellow of the New York Foundation for the Arts, the McDowell Colony, and Breadloaf, and is a fellow of the New York Institute for the Humanities. She teaches undergraduate and graduate students in the writing program at Sarah Lawrence College. I am most pleased and join me in welcoming Rachel Cohen. Instead of entrenching and fighting, his armies moved around their enemies. 
His engineers built bridges and tunnels and dams to get soldiers over and through barriers. Grant was the first general to start a battle by having his commanders synchronize their launches. And he realized that failing to move through the landscape in a certain amount of time was the surest way to lose the war. Victory was on the side of motion. Grant saw his forces emerging out of the terrain and taking shape across it. Both Brady and Grant had really staked everything that they had, both sort of personally and politically, on um, the Union forces in the Civil War. And so they had a lot invested in kind of letting the world know that the war was going well. Um, and they had reason to make this photograph as persuasive as possible. Um, and so um, the end of this little passage that I'm reading follows from that um, from that understanding of what it was that they were trying to accomplish in terms of making a place for themselves in history. The nearsighted entrepreneur and the man who was trying to win the bloodiest war in American history were not especially concerned to make a beautiful photograph. But as soon as the photograph was developed, Grant and Brady would have seen that the wide wings of the tent, the contrast of the white ground with the dark figure, and the graceful posture of the hero would all help to confer the immortality that both the general and his photographer were seeking. So here's the first way of thinking about um, time, which is to think about our time in history and our sense of time, um, our sense of our time and its relationship to history. It's obviously part of what I was trying to do in my book to watch people inscribing themselves in history, as Brady and Grant were doing um, in that moment. And then I wanted to think about how we um, now go back and look at the history that they made. Um, and I've noticed a few shifts that I think you probably can confirm for me um, in the kind of history that readers are right now most interested to look at. It seems to me that um, biography is much more popular than it used to be maybe 40 years ago. Um, that we read lots and lots of individual lives of people. Um, if you think of um, their blockbuster biographies now, you think of like the, the cover of the John Adams biography, or you're sort of used to biographies as a present force. Um, and also that there are, there are movies, there are biopics, there are the biographies that are optioned for films. Um, and another thing that I think has happened is that literary novels have become more historical. So that it used to be kind of a separate genre that people would write um, kind of history novels almost the way they would write romance novels. You know, there would be Bottas Rivers, they would have Nates and that and stuff. And now it seems like they're really, um, it's uh, many, many of the books that we consider kind of high level literary fiction are set in historical periods. Like think of, say Michael Cunningham's The Hours, or Paul Twiggy's The Master, or Salma Rushdie's Midnight's Children, or Jose Saramago's books, that, that it's actually quite common for people to be setting their novels in historical um, places. And the third kind of shift is the popularity of the memoir, um, that we read enormously more memoirs than we used to read 30 years ago. It's a, I, I was in the cellar bookstore today, that down in Melbourne, and there, the front and center section is biography and memoir together. You know, those two things are a category. There's U.S. History World History, and then there's biography and memoir, which is two bookshelves. And neither of those things was a separate shelf in the bookstore 40 years ago. Um, so I'm interested in these three shifts, why we're kind of reading in this way, and I think that Part of what's happening is that we're very, very interested in the personal in history. We'd like to be in contact with an individual's experience. Um, and so um, that you kind of, you see this even in newspapers, that newspaper articles much more frequently now start with an individual's experience, like not just the economic crisis, but Joe Smith's experience of the economic crisis. Um, and, and that's because we all sort of are anticipating that we feel a human connection when we know an individual is having an experience as opposed to a large kind of broad force. Um, so my sense that we're all yearning for the personal in history
history was certainly part of why I used um, imagined scenes in my work. It was partly to bring out um, the kind of the personal connection that people might feel to individuals in history. I wanted to write about them as individuals and not in kind of giant historical time, but in kind of small, ordinary living time. Um, and that was part of how I could myself work my way into the sense of great historical time without getting lost, which is a, which is a fear of a, of a writer. Um, so what do I mean by giant historical time? Let's, um, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, if you would mind helping me, would you, would you all give me some examples of uh, large-scale phenomenon, like events, big events that are going on right now in the world? Sorry? An election. Election, yes. Yeah. A political campaign. Yeah. Global warming. Global warming, yeah. <laughs> a good one. The tsunami in Southeast Asia. I'm sorry? The tsunami in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. The uh, consumption. Yeah. It's the continuation and eventual decline of the wars that we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. Genocide in Sudan. Yeah. Starting to sound pretty bleak, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Okay, so now, how do you find out about those things when you want to know about them? Conversation with people. NPR. Mm-hmm. Newspapers. Mm-hmm. MSNBC. Mm-hmm. Blogs. Almost Fox News. We could be. <laughs> <laughs> the grandparents, the migrants. 
childhood, he gets his education, and then suddenly, funk, the author says, oh, by the way, the economy was bad and there was a disease epidemic. And so sort of this history comes in kind of from the side, and there are two things that are not on the same scale at all. So this sort of drawing impression that you can put into some other scale, and then you go back to the school room and you kind of are talking again in a personal. And in novels, too, you get this feeling of history when it's a historical novel. There's a kind of backdrop, a historical backdrop that kind of unrolls, and you just feel the history kind of come down behind the characters. Um, and you get a long, elaborate description of like what shoes people wore or something like that, because the writer has gone and done a lot of research and wants you to know that they've done a lot of research, which is great that they've done the research. And actually, we really expect our novelists now to be historians, which we didn't used to do. Like, we actually hold novelists to standards of fact-checking that used to be reserved for journalists, and you get these apologetic introductions to novels where people say, I'm sorry, I don't know for sure if this happened or not, I took the liberty of making it up, which is odd because we all know that novels are made up, but we're really hoping to get history in a lot of places. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I, I just wanted to go on the Separated from. 
And that sense, I think, is um, of the kind of remoteness of even one's own historical past is part of why we, we feel ourselves needing the personal in order to kind of re-enter the flow of continuous history. Um, so uh, what, I, what I was sort of going to say now is that that was part of my um, hope for doing this kind of imagined um, work is that it would help people to find their way back into a longer continuous spread of history. Um, and I think it really takes a huge amount of detailed work to, to get the reader to sort of step easily into what we now think of as a very remote world. Um, so, and uh, I think that if you want to get the reader to have that experience, then you sort of have to um, develop that experience for yourself as a writer. And this uh, brings me to my uh, second view of time, which is the more private and personal view of time. Um, Some of you will remember that in the introduction to my book, I said that many of the people gathered in the book were keeping me company 10 years ago in a solitary year that I spent driving around the United States. And what I did say in the introduction, but um, without which I think we will get nowhere in our pursuit of understanding why they have time, is that I had a very romantic idea of going out on the road when I set out. I had read John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie and Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and I wanted to write a book like those, full of assertions and pronouncements and wild hazards. <laughs> and I had a number of disadvantages. The first one was that I had no dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a crucial element of John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie, and I didn't have one. The second one is that I had my parents' old blue song, which was not a romance of the road kind of car. In fact, it looked very strange and snobbish to some of the people um, when I drove into their towns. So and there was a guy at the gas station who asked me, what kind of car is that? Is that a station? <laughs> so I knew that I was not blending into the landscape in a way that somehow it seemed like Jack Kerouac had managed to do. I was not a robust and genial man in the town of I was a bookish, nerdy girl with an awkward short haircut that I had done for myself, some deliberately ill-fitting flannel shirts, and a lot of depressed anxiety. <laughs> this meant that I was in a terrible hurry. I saw interesting looking people, but I was afraid to stop to talk to them, which is very much the point that we were making. Um, I, um, the ones I did talk to, I hurried my questions and their answers, and frequently hurried out of the conversations before I really heard what they had to say. I didn't write down a lot of what I heard. I drove the back roads, and that meant I had to go slowly, but I was all the time pressing forward, and, I was, and the sort of experiences were lacking behind me. The one place where I really did not hurry was in reading. The one place where I really sat still and took the world in was reading Ulysses Grant or Willie Cather, both incidentally great writers of history. And it was, um, it, that was for me, I guess I, I'm imagining that, like most of you, I, I read every day, and um, and I feel hungry at night if I go to bed without reading. And um, I don't think that anyone can really learn to write well without reading. But I also think that the relationship is different between reading and writing for most people. And privately, for me, reading is a way of becoming integrated with time in a way that such a way that its passage is not a truncation. In other words, it's through reading that I come back into a relationship with history. And so there are other ways of encountering history, and visiting history in different ways is a significant part of that. Um, I went to the battlefield at Vicksburg, and I read um, things that I, like materials that I encountered along the way, and I picked up Grant's memoirs of the battlefield, and I discovered in reading them that they had been published by Mark Twain. So, there, there's also a lot of circumstantial work, but the reading was the central thing for me. And, um, and the daily work of it is something that I think is important to emphasize in any writer's relationship to time, that you're, it has to be sort of indefatigable. You really have to write often and work and practice to learn to do it better. And I think that one of the disservices that is done uh, for all of us by 
kind of romantic idea that we have of Jack Kerouac, who wrote it all in one night, and, which is not necessarily true. He wrote a lot of drafts for on the road. But that you, you've, you don't realize that, in fact, it's very hard work. And then when you go to do it yourself, you think, what's wrong with me? I'm not getting the inspiration. There's no giant lightning strike of clarity and realization for me. There's only um, more drudgery of sentences. And, but that's actually, in fact, what Jack Kerouac had too, and what I discovered I also had to do. Um, so now I wanted to say, a sort of third view of time, some kind of uh, close and concrete things about the craft of writing in managing time. And the first thing I want to talk about is verb tenses, which might feel very small as a thing to think about, but in fact can be quite significant, because of course your sense of time is in your verbs. That's where you kind of can feel whether an action happened in the past or in the present or is to come in the future. And one thing that's happened is that much of our kind of cultural prose right now is being written in the present tense. Newspapers are writing in the present tense. Lots of books take place entirely in the present tense. Memoirs are written in the present tense. And they do this because it feels active and it feels immediate and it gives you a sense that things are happening right in front of you. Um, and I even heard Glenn Graham, who's the editor of Scribner's, tell an audience of people such as yourselves that they should all just start writing in the present tense. That, that was, you know, that was the wave of the future. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it could be. It could be. It probably is. But I think there's a problem with it. And here's the problem, I think. When you use the present tense for immediacy, you say, like, she runs down the street, she leaps in front of a car, she dashes forward, right? You kind of have this sense of the movement of the pros. But think about trying to think in that tense. She runs down the street, she dashes in front of a car, she thinks to herself, it sounds a little funny, right? She thinks to herself that she will never be a writer. When you hear that sentence, what the present tense means and what it indicates to you is that she hasn't yet finished her thought, right? She thinks to herself she'll never be a writer. We kind of know she's wrong. We can tell that, that, that that's a sort of, it's a state of mind, but she's going to pass through it, and something else is going to come next. And so the present tense actually means that she's not expressing a conviction. She's expressing a kind of momentary passing idea. And you, another way that you can tell this is um, that the word thought, our word thought, is the past tense of to think. And it comes from the old English, get off to it, and the past tense. And, um, and it, it indicates that something which has been thought, a thought, is in the past. When you've thought it through, it's in the past, the thinking. And that means that when you want to write about thoughts, it's much easier to use the past tense than the present tense. And so when people want to write reflective prose in which you address the major social issues of our day, which is obvious in this audience are of very importance, it's a real question, what tense you choose, in terms of how to develop your thought for you. So, and another thing that um, happens with tenses is, um, say, there's a literary present tense, which is the tense where you say, Elizabeth Bishop writes an essay about Marianne Moore, or Elizabeth Bishop writes in her essay, you've all written many papers in which you use the literary present tense, and it's a good tense, it's useful. Joyce has Bloom do this. Um, Dietrich Spivak names three kinds of that. Um, but if you're trying to get a character to have a place in time, then the present tense has this kind of diffuse quality. Elizabeth Bishop seems to be still doing it now, and you can't really look at her. You can't even really tell what she would look like doing that. But if I say, Elizabeth Bishop wrote an essay about Marianne Moore, she immediately becomes human again. Right? She comes down to human size, you can see her, she's kind of shadowed, you have a sense of her presence. And so that means that she re-enters history in a way. She's dislodged from history in the literary present, and she's in history in the past tense. So there are a lot of technical decisions that you can make as a writer which help to integrate the sense of history, the small figure, and the big forces of history into the same sentence. So, what I was, I was going to read a couple of sections, one of um, Elizabeth Bishop kind of making a description and one of me making a description in order to talk about narrative momentum. But I think that what I'll do is instead um, 
augment my own momentum and um, reserve that for anybody who's interested. And um, instead, talk a little bit more about one other kind of technical consideration, which is um, that I think one thing that you're trying to do in developing character is to think about time. And this is related to the things that I've been talking about. When you have a character, I think all characters have characteristic things. You know, you have a way of sitting forward with a certain kind of expression and a way that your hair falls over your shoulders, and you have a way of rubbing your nose, and you have a way of standing <laughs> and sitting. All those things are totally characteristic. Um, people have characteristic handwriting and characteristic gestures, um, and they um, have characteristic relationships to time. So that when you're defining a character in a novel or in a nonfiction work, you're thinking about what is the relationship between this individual and the sense of time. Um, and so, um, the, when I had in my book the 30 figures that I was dealing with, one of the difficulties was trying to integrate all their senses of time. In the same way that you, know, you go to meet a friend of yours and you think, oh, James holds late, and then um, she is late, and then you're a little irritated because you've been waiting. And so there's a kind of little conflict between you and Jamie over your different senses of time. And in a novel or a book, too, it's a place where there's friction among characters that they have different senses of time. And when you're making a long, expensive book in the way that I did, with lots of different figures in it, you're constantly trying to negotiate how they manage their sense of time. So Elizabeth Bishop is always late, Marianne Moore is always on time, this is frustrating to Marianne Moore, it makes Elizabeth Bishop anxious, Marianne Moore wears two washes, she's so adamant about being on time, Elizabeth Bishop is always losing her watch. And this actually makes a kind of tension in a piece, a section of my book in which I was writing about those two figures together. And so um, other kinds of figures also have other kinds of ideas of time. I wrote about Robin Becton, who was um, a significant figure in the Harlem Renaissance, and he uh, famously was one of the first men in America to have a wristwatch. And so for that, for example, is a reason why I thought it was important to pay attention to the particular detail of clothing that he was wearing. I didn't tell you about his top hats or his swallowtail coats or all the other things that I might have told you about. But his wristwatch was uh, indicative of himself and of his, I'm trying to address your question, though I'm, I'm not sure if you're, yeah, okay. Um, but his wristwatch was kind of indicative of his sense of time and therefore was an important kind of feature to bring out and give a sense of. Um, and and in similarly, in writing about um, John Cage, who had a very experimental sense of time and put time together in little increments to make his pieces, I was very concerned to get a sense of how people are moving in time but having different experiences of time at the same time. Um, so, so this was the kind of fourth way of thinking about time. And I thought that I would just read you a little passage of the John Cage section so that you could hear that knowing that I had that consideration, and then I'd be really happy to take some questions. John Cage and Marcel Duchamp were interested in measurement. They particularly liked to know the answer to the question, for how long? A friend of Duchamp said of him that his finest work is his use of time. Duchamp loved chess in part because he could see the game developing across time in his mind. He said the four-dimensionality of chess made it a visual and plastic thing. Cage, though he probably didn't think of it as an inheritance from General Grant, often specified that his performers synchronized their watches before beginning. And later, he composed a work that would take 600 years to perform. A cathedral in Germany eventually undertook the project. To make his most famous piece, 4 minutes and 33 seconds, Cage used chance operations and the charts of the ancient Chinese Book of Changes, also called the I Ching, to determine thousands of tiny increments of time, which he then added up into three movements. For 4 minutes and 33 seconds, the pianist was to come out and sit in utter silence. This piece caused a furor when it was premiered. 
John Cage's dearest friends, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg and Bruce Cunningham, also became involved with the work of Duchamp. Johns and Rauschenberg took to coming around fairly often. They had been to Philadelphia together, and they had loved of Duchamp's works, the ready-mades that he made, and also his large glass, which you can see is a very beautiful giant glass, which is like a window, and it's drawn on um, with a kind of melted lead. Um, Johns conceived the idea of building a version of the large glass, which was to be used as a set for one of Cunningham's dance pieces, which is called Walk Around in Time. He later said it when he proposed the idea that Duchamp, with a look of horror on his face, asked who would build the set. He relaxed when John said he would do it himself. Duchamp, though aloof, was glad of this new attention. He had gambled heavily that the artists of the future would care for his work, and as he prepared his final moves, it was very nice to feel that he could count on Johns and Rauschenberg and Cunningham and Cage. The set for Walker and Time was made of plastic pieces resembling the elements of a large glass. It was, according to people who saw it, extraordinarily beautiful. Cunningham remembered that, after the dance performance, Duchamp, though he said he was nervous, held his head up and went on stage to take his bath, climbing the stairs without once looking down. Duchamp's fundamental work was his because he chose it, and also because it happened to him by chance. He found it easier to work this way in America. But he also said that his choices weren't without antecedent. Duchamp thought of himself as drawing on Bertrand Stein, with whom he had so urgently debated the fourth dimension 50 years before at the Rue Flores where she lived. In a rare interview given at the very end of his life, Duchamp compared himself to Stein, and began to explain the lineage of his own American traditions. But the interviewer, who made the common mistake of believing that because each American chooses his or her own influences, America lacks tradition, missed the significance of what Duchamp was saying and interrupted him. So as I was writing this talk, I looked up a little bit on the web about the history of watches. Um, and I just wanted to let you know in closing that a, a watch, a wrist watch, a clock watch, um, the name watch comes from uh, observation, from to watch, from to look at things. It used to be um, that there were watches of the night, which were times when people got up at night to keep observation. You know, like on a ship, you had watches. And um, the OED explains that the, the Hebrews divided the night into three watches, the Greeks into four, the Romans usually into four. Um, and so uh, when clocks were invented that could wake you up in the night, it was, uh, they could um, let you know that it was time for your watch. And that's how we have watches. And, um, and I think this is kind of useful for thinking about the relationship between time and writing. Because really what you're doing when you're writing is you're putting periods of time into watching. You really are kind of slowing time down and looking very hard. Um, and that, once you begin to do that, then you're kind of in a place to do the other work that I think is so important of trying to integrate the kind of indi the individual and the large forces acting on the individual and to try to think through how those things are in relationship so that you lose neither the individual nor the large forces. Um, and so uh, what I want to encourage the new students here to um, do, because it's uh, one of the pleasures that you have to look forward to in the year that's coming, um, is that you have a lot of time for reading and writing. Um, and I think one thing I learned in reading to write my book and then in writing it so that it could be read is that when you make time for books, then this very beautiful thing which is that they, in turn, will make time in all its wonderful weight and strangeness for you. Thank you very much.
it was a way to talk about what I did that, that um, is currently of interest to me. Um, so that was part of it. I did think that I was writing about history, and, um, and history and time are obviously very connected to each other. So, um, so I did have that kind of clearly in mind, that I wanted somehow to find, um, to find a way to write in history in a vivid way. Um, and the expanse of time that I chose, I think uh, there were a number of things that, that were reasons for it. Um, one was that I thought there were a lot of political inheritances that kind of happened in that arc. Like, I really felt that the civil rights movement showed again many of the same social fractures that the Civil War had embodied. And so I wanted to show the arc from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. I thought that was um, a kind of unit of time in which you could watch these social forces and that that would be um, interesting and, um, and was a way to give a large historical frame to a number of smaller, more immediate interactions. Um, and I also wanted um, to give a long sense of lineage. Like I wanted to be able to think um, what I'm inheriting as a writer now is not just from people who wrote 30 years ago, but also the people who wrote 100 years ago. And so to show their own inheritances, the things that they turned to look back to, um, I needed a bigger expense of time. So you could get many generations of writers. And those were some of the other reasons. Yeah, please. Um, I already talked a little bit in the introduction about why you chose the characters that you chose. Mm -hmm. question and actually one I was talking about with the gentleman behind you um, at a, earlier in the afternoon. Um, yeah, I, one of the central criteria for choosing the figures was that I was interested in the relationships they had. So I was choosing much more based on relationships than on individual accomplishment. Like it was never intended to be a kind of pantheon of like who I think are the best American artists or something like that. I really wasn't thinking on those grounds. Um, and, and in fact, I think I left out most of the people whose work I really adore. Like, I would, I would definitely put Emily Dickinson among favorite writers of mine. Um, and so I, I really was trying to get these kind of effects of presence of what people would be like in, um, in a room, how they would influence each other. And so it was very important to me that the, what record was left. Like, if there were things from which I really could I thought, with careful research, reconstruct the situation, then that was much more compelling to me than um, anything else. So like, I really liked, um, I really like Henry Adams, he's a favorite writer of mine, and I thought, oh, it'd be great to put Henry Adams in this book, but I, he's a very cantankerous guy, he's very private, all his writing kind of takes itself back, and I could not get him to kind of walk into a room, he just, he didn't want to. And, um, and that seems reasonable to me, you know, you can refuse, and he did. So, um, so I, I was careful to be picking people who I really thought I could do this with in a way that seemed responsible. Um, and I guess the last thing about the choices is that I also wanted to give a sense of the kind of complexity of the artistic landscape, that there are people who are doing all these very vital things that are maybe not noticed, like bringing people together and taking portraits and giving money so that my student who's going to finish his first book. And, um, and I wanted the richness of all of that, too. So I also chose people who maybe didn't make great work, but who made great contributions. You know, you know. Yes, I saw you doing a couple of hands back there. Um, yeah, behind you, and then, and then Mark, you. Behind me or behind him? You first, you, you just asked. Yes. Um, when you were um, like making up situations and based off of your uh, knowledge of the character, situations that you that could have happened but you weren't sure who you did. How did you navigate between the, the find the medium between the true and the untrue? Yeah, that's the vital question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I think I'm not always entirely happy with the way that I manage this problem. Um, but the the my main motivation, my main hope was that I felt that if the people were acting like people and moving like people. If you, if I could write them that way and you could read them that way, then all the things.
things about their, um, what happened to them, what they, what they wanted to accomplish, would be sort of connected to a real person. And so I was trying to find things that I thought were really characteristic of that particular person and to, and to embody them in those scenes so that you can see them happen. So for example, in the chapter on Park Crane, or one of the chapter where Park Crane commits suicide, there's, it is documented that the thing that Park Crane did before he jumped over the um, side of the ship is that he took off his coat and he folded it and he hung it over the rail and jumped off. He was an extremely meticulous person and had, a, I think that conveys a very strong sense of his kind of personal movement in the world in a way that's related to a lot of fundamental things about the work that he did. Um, so I, when I introduced Hart Crane, I had him kind of pacing in his room and I had him make that gesture, which is a, a known gesture in the game. Though I don't know if he made a gesture in the scene in which I gave it to him today. And so what I wanted to do was to give you a clear sense of how he moved in the world um, right from the beginning. So I was choosing based on that kind of thing. Like I wasn't wildly just imagining anything. I was trying to really use things that I felt I had discovered in the research that I could use to eliminate the figures. But then writing in prose, it felt more like a novel so that you could, I hope, see it. Um, so that's very different than some things that people do where they just kind of make a scene for the pleasure of making a scene but not going to the research. So that was, that was the distinction I was trying to make is, do I know it to really feel characteristic based on what I've studied? Uh, Mark and then, and then yeah. Thanks. You, you mentioned along, very much along those lines. You mentioned uh, a book like uh, *Calm for Man*, *The mm -hmm. Master*. Um, given that, that, that he is a novelist, mm -hmm. but yet he is, is writing really what, in the end, is a very illuminating biography of mm -hmm. Henry James. Or I, I think it's someone like Colin Cannes *Dancer*, mm -hmm. which is. It's about Rudolf Nerea, but he barely names Nerea in it, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's a wonderful window into someone else's life. But again, Paul McCann is a novelist, oh, yeah. and they are presenting these things as novels, novels. meticulously researched, which was your, your yeah. earlier point. Your book, and I guess the question that I have is, if one thinks in terms of genres mm -hmm. like that, um, a book like The Master presents itself as a novel that is a, a novelized biography of an actual person about whom there are reams yes. of stuff. How would you, it, do you, I, I guess the two questions, do you feel a need to characterize your work and place it in a genre? And if so, what, what, what would that be and mm. why, given yeah. that landscape that exists? Right. Um, and one thing I've tried is imaginative nonfiction, um, and that um, it's a little um, clumsy, but it does get at some of the, the borderline that I, that I think it's along. Um, and I think that, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult thing to try to decide what degree of imagination is appropriate and what really, what really works, both to engage the reader, but also to um, to do something that feels artistically truthful. And um, I think it's actually very hard to write a book about a known figure in fiction because you're sort of constantly negotiating what people already know about them. Um, so, but yeah, I think to me it was important that, um, that this was not a novel. Like I didn't, I didn't want to write it as a set of plays or something in which these figures acted, um, because I wanted, uh, I wanted their actual words to count for a lot. Like I quote them a lot, and I think once you've made a character in a novel and you quote them, it's, it's, it doesn't ring true anymore. It's just a character, and it's your character, and in fact, it's very hard to put the language in such a way that you really can hear them speaking. So you lose a certain degree of the authenticity of the original person's voice when you move into fiction. And so the thing that I was doing of kind of assembling a kind of panoply of actual voices, I would have lost if I moved on into fiction. Thank you.
that's not conflict. And I think, I think that that may be part of what you're missing in terms of the sense of what would be plotted. Right. And then the other thing that I would say is that um, while I'm very interested in establishing continuous time, I actually think that our experiences of time are so discontinuous that it's actually difficult to plunge people into continuous time. They don't immediately feel it. So that the sections of the book, in a way, and the discontinuities that you're sensing are, I think, an important part of making the sense of time kind of, um, I don't really like this word, but relatable, something that the reader can kind of feel is akin to uh, using her own experience of time. One, one more question, Rachel. Oh, okay. oh only one more. Okay. Um, I was just, I, I, this is ridiculous, it's specific, and I'm sorry about that. But um, I just, the thing that I really noticed throughout uh, this text is that um, you, what you really do is you do a wonderful job of personalizing these people. I mean, I, I was thinking especially for Chuck Walt Whitman. I mean, Walt Whitman is a literary saint where, like, you know, Walt Whitman, is, he's kind of a mythological figure in a way, but at the same time, you kind of turn him into this actual person. Um, the question is, um, with some of the people that we don't actually have as much writing from and as much writing about, I was thinking specifically of uh, the, uh, the artists and uh, particularly Matthew Brady, um, you do a great job of d establishing his character, but, and there was one line that I was, th this is why it's so specific, this is one line that I was really curious about Shoes always gave corpses more. Shoes gave corpses more humanity. Mm -hmm. That I mean, it's such an internal thought, and it's such a character building line. I just wanted to know if you had anything in particular to say about that line. And he did that. <laughs> yeah, he put shoes in his photographs, and and he said he said exactly those words, but he said that it was important to have them there um, because they established something about that. So in that, it was a made an internal thought out of something that I found in. In research. Um, and I think that I, when I initially made my book, I did not make notes at the end in which I explained what I knew and what I didn't know. I just wrote it. Um, and then when it was going to be published, people said it was important that there be that kind of clarification. And so I was glad to go back and do that. But I actually did it in a fairly cursory way. Like I didn't give line by line sources, but there's, there are generally two or three sources for every line of the book. So that it's, though it seems very imagined, it's all really based in, in things I read. Um, so if you were a historian of any of those periods and people, you would know where the things were. But I think if I were going to do it again, I would um, make the detail, the bio, um, uh, notes available online. I mean, I think it would be really cumbersome in a book for the 200 pages of notes. But at least that way people wanted to know that Brady said she was a course for humanity, they could look it up. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Or? Okay, oh, we'll yeah. I'm a, primarily a literature student, and I think I became interested in time in much the same way I imagine that you did. Um, so I thought in the spirit of liberal arts, I'd take a class on Einstein and special relativity, mm -hmm. and I got a dean. <laughs> 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 I think it's all right. You know, it's great to make the effort towards science, really, but, but don't, don't take it personally in terms of your writing career. Um, I, had a, I had a kind of similar experience. My, my main exposure to the theory of time is.